in the title of your paper, Beyond the Biopsychosocial Model, there are inherent limitations to any model, and, and there's a reason that we're attempting to extend it and progress it. So I'd like to hear your thoughts, both of your thoughts, on the limitations of the biopsychosocial model, not necessarily in construct, or maybe in construct, but more so in how we tend to interpret it and implement it in practice. Yeah. Uh, Catherine, did you want, like, I, 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 I can just jump gonna, in? or Yeah, I'll let you uh, pick up all the pieces that I don't say. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> I, I think the other bit is that although um, Angle, you know, had this this uh, um, model, a lot of people were getting to it in a lot of different ways. So, um, you know, I, it's not really that long ago that the the flag system started around pain. You know, the black and the blue and the red and the yellow and the green, um, and the yellow flags were psychosocial flags, right? So we've been talking about it a lot of different ways, and uh, I think the the reason why the biopsychosocial model tends to hang together and stick with us a little bit, kind of like Descartes, is that it it sort of clearly says, you know, it's more than um, the the uh, the um, a uh, linear um, dualistic way of thinking about it. You know, there's pain uh, and there's, the, you know, the Descartes uh, model is what I'm trying to say. It's clearly more than that. There's a psychological element. There's a social element. So I think that's what is attractive about it rather than a complex theory that maybe, you know, takes, is difficult to describe and to grab a hold of. So so I, it will be with us for a long time. And, I, and I, there's a lot of good in it, right? There's a lot of good in it. And that's, we're not trying to suggest that we need to throw the whole thing out. Um, uh, we are just extending uh, through uh, the work of other, uh, on top of the work of others or using the work of others, um, the idea of uh, a, a, just another kind of way of putting into words and it, with examples and with explanations that are um, built on science and philosophy. Uh, another way of, of of looking at pain. So so it's not we're not saying biopsychosocial is no good. We want that to be really clear. There are some challenges um, with it, and uh, and that is why we are offering an, a, another way of looking at it. So maybe Peter, you can maybe review what we said in the paper about the the the, the drawbacks. Yeah. Uh I think you brought up such great points too, and it's the same with the biomedical model, right? It's like you don't just totally toss all that foundation once you you go to the biopsychosocial foundation, right? It's you, you just update certain pieces of it and try to be. I, I, I think Quinn in your journal club you say just try to be less wrong, right? Um, and, and try to update update things. So, uh, yeah, and I think it, part of it kind of came off harsh, especially with the the title. Um, which is a bit provocative. And I know some people are like, they, they see that and they're like, damn it. Like I would just got a handle on this biopsychosocial model. <laughs> that's what the New students in our forum. Yeah. That's what they're saying. They're like, Oh, <laughs> don't tell me this. Yeah. Not, not nothing new again. Not something new again. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know where you find these. They, they were bright, like super like critical thinkers, like Great uh, such an um, amazing, like I was hyped that they liked the paper and they were, they were they were thinking about how they can apply it and um i should really say like the when this paper like when we published it the goal wasn't to go to it to go to clinicians that wasn't the, that wasn't the plan it was to lay out a theoretical academic foundation which we would then strip down uh less jar less kind of philosophical jargon and then bring it to to clinicians and we i thought that we we're going to have to have all these KT strategies, knowledge translation strategies, and, and to get in the hands of clinicians, but it's been a couple of months and people have already jumped on it and are applying it. And I'm like, like some of these people, I'm like, you, you're applying it better than I could, like, <laughs> like, uh, which, which I found interesting, but uh, back to your, your, your question, right? So what are some of these limitations that we suggest in the, in the paper? I guess number one is we argue that it really lacks a strong theoretical foundation, um, especially when it pertains to the phenomenology of pain. So that meaning that first person or subjective experience, 
that uh, really valuing that that narrative that the patient has. So the biopsychosocial model doesn't explicitly have a theoretical foundation with that. And we're not the first people to say that. Others have, have said it, but uh, we, we kind of built on, on those ideas. Um, and there's other components, uh, contemporary views related to perception that aren't uh, inherently embedded in that biopsychosocial model as proposed by Engel. And I guess the, the biggest probably part of the paper that we, uh, in terms of limitations, we talk about practical application, how uh, really because of that lack of theoretical foundation, it's extremely difficult to start to apply in a meaningful, meaningful way, or, or you can apply it, but potentially we could optimize how it's applied if we actually have an extension or, or these other type of theoretical underpinnings. So we give a couple examples of, of kind of what we see in terms of these biopsychosocial proponents doing, including myself not too long ago. So we, we even published a paper, I think it was like 2017 that was part of my master's, like, uh, I think we call it like contemporary biopsychosocial exercise prescription for low back pain. And it was challenging core stability and talking about context. And really, we we're advocating the biopsychosocial model uh, quite, quite strongly. And we've shifted our views, or at least I have quite a bit uh, uh, since then. Um, and so we argue that there's these individuals that propose uh, that use the VPS model in a very reductionist way. So they, they ultimately end up saying, oh, well, pain is in the brain. It's an output of the brain and uh, really have this kind of disembodied view of, of pain that doesn't really match our, our contemporary views of, of perception. And then we also talk about how people <laughs> end up actually being dualist almost in, in a way where they say, oh, well, if we can't find the biological factors, these mechanical factors that explain pain, it must be psychosocial or it must be psychogenic uh, in nature. It must be in the mind. So you have like prominent definitions, which you guys are, are I know are well aware of, like the IASP, International Association for the Study of Pain. Uh, they essentially say as a part of their definition to this day that if, if, if there is no kind of physiological explanation, the pain is psychogenic. Uh, it's essentially a dualist view and it, it, I think it really needs to be updated and well, I'm not the only person. There's many others that say that it needs to be updated as well because it it potentially stigmatizes patients. So those are the types of things that we see, like people trichotomize or dichotomize the biopsychosocial model and want to break it up. And really that was, Engel didn't want that. Like it, going into his papers, he thought that it was the dynamic interaction, but because of that lack of, I think, robust theory to really guide how it it, it pans out in practice, it ends up getting messy like that. I think that's one of the reasons why clinicians have been drawn so quickly to this paper and these kinds of concepts, because you mention it in the paper, we very frequently ask ourselves, well, how do we avoid communicating to the patient that this is just in their head, right? And we, we do dichotomize quite a bit when it comes to this model, and it, it's the one limitation that stuck with me was we're very, so critical of the biomedical model and how dualistic it is. But in practice, we tend to also be dualistic with the biopsychosocial model, where the five E's, which we'll get to describing in here a little bit, I think it hashes out and bridges the gaps to those dichotomies and trichotomies to people. And, and it gives them a, a more robust framework to kind of chew on and better understand what they're actually trying to accomplish. Um, there's so many things in there, and we, we've the three of us have talked about this paper quite a bit. There's so many things in there that gave us like, oh, okay, that so that makes more sense, uh -huh. right? They're they're embedded. That's why this is. It, that's another aspect you can bring in. So it, it helps uh, build a bigger picture for people and fill in some of those blanks that we just haven't really had. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. It's wonderful. And that's why I think people have been drawn to it because it, it it's it's helpful to conceptualize. Mm -hmm. that, thanks for that. Yeah. yeah, I thought people were just gonna like clinicians. I was like, if they get to it, I thought they're gonna just toss it in the garbage. Too long, too dense. Yeah, not really. Like, yeah, yeah. So uh, you said so, something yeah. interesting earlier, Peter. And 
for your the way that you guys framed this initially, it was it was meant to spawn research questions, and then you would plan to distill it down a little bit for, for a clinical practice. That actually makes a lot of sense to me, because that was going to be something I, I wanted to talk to you guys about, because people can try to compartmentalize, compartmentalize anything, right? They can take these five E's that we're going to talk about and try to memorize those and say, all right, have I ticked the box? Did I do embodied treatment today? Did I do, you know what I mean? Did I cover all the bases? <laughs> yeah. Kind of like exactly how you guys were talking about in the paper, biopsychosocial, even though you've got this Venn diagram where the three worlds overlap, you still, did I tick off the biological box and the psychosocial? Yeah. Did I talk, was I nice to them? Okay, cool, I did my psychosocial intervention. Did I tell them that their parent, that their family member telling them that their knee hurts, maybe not a good idea? Okay, cool. I checked off the social box. And then we could do it with this too. These word, these terms that we're going to go over, the reason that this paper pulls on my heartstrings so much is because I see it as a parallel to the way that we tend to frame movement and motor learning through a dynamical systems lens. And I know it's in there because you guys – <laughs> reference over James Gibson and these these other uh, researchers and, and that are just kind of like forefathers of dynamical systems and ecological dynamics and these types of things. And that's the lens that our community tends to use for movement. And so now I'm reading this as a lens to, to understand pain and this perception and action coupling that we talk about for squatting and running and sprinting and jumping. And now we're talking about the experience of pain. I fell in love right away because of that. 